Well, good morning and welcome on this beautiful first Sunday in August to the worship of our great God and King. It's great to see everyone here this morning. Uh, I have just a few announcements. Uh, the deacons will meet uh, next week uh, as per their normal schedule. Some of the other events will be uh, happening as we go. Uh, that are listed there uh, in your Bibles. And again, we'll have Bible study tonight as we have been on Sunday nights for quite a while. If you haven't been coming to that, come and join us. Uh, we're going to have a, a dinner um, first Sunday in October, I believe, to uh, kick off reading of the New Testament. So, if you haven't been reading the Old Testament or you got behind and you kind of gave up, um, and I understand I've done that in my life as well, um, if you would like to read the New Testament all the way through uh, chronologically and then come and be a part of a actually a pretty interesting uh, discussion group on Sunday nights at 5.30 for that, uh, look forward to and be thinking about uh, starting to join us uh, there for the New Testament. And we'll be for having dinner that night <clears throat> for everyone who wants to come and kind of kick off the, the New Testament. So I look forward to that time. And you'll be hearing more about that in, uh, in the days ahead. Our call to worship comes to us from Isaiah 40. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Let's pray together. Almighty God, judge of all of us, you have placed in our hands the wealth we call our own. Through your Spirit, give us wisdom that our purpose may not be a curse, but a blessing to the lives of others. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning. If you will stand with me and turn to page 63 and sing all creatures of our God and King, and we will sing one, two, and five. They're marked in your books. So.
Father, as we come into your presence, we would cry out for forgiveness of our sins. We would come this morning confessing those sins before you, those acts that we've done that are against your glory, those things that we haven't done that we should have that are have left your glory un, unspoken of. Father, we pray and thank you for the forgiveness that comes in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who for us men and for our salvation did bear the cross and the shame of the cross and the wrath of the cross so that he might, through your power, rise from the dead, ascend to heaven, and draw us who are called to him. Father, assure us of that pardon as far as the east is from the west. Separate our sins from us and from your sight, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Vision Committee, that committee is made up of uh, Jennifer Vischer and Martha Scott and Chris Silvey and Bill Cooper and uh, Johnny Gordy and Ricky Sapp and kind of a uh, special advisor, Roger Burge, who started on that and, and then uh, moved to a new role for that committee. Has been working now for well over a year and a half and you've seen some of the fruit of that work through a new logo a new mission statement some new uh, goals and and some new values that are portrayed there in your bulletin each and every week and over that time we've been talking and assessing what we need to continue to do to uh, move forward the mission of our our church and it was brought up at that meeting uh, well over a year ago that we needed a new sign uh, for our church uh, the sign that we have is probably 50 years old and it's hard to read and we felt like we should move into the the 21st century at least in terms of, of that. And so we've been working on that idea, thinking about what could happen, how we could craft a new uh, opportunity to show the community that we are here, that we are active, and that we are uh, at work in the kingdom of, of God. Well, as that um, discussion continued, even in the midst of making decisions on value and visions and so forth, um, we began to think about what we could do if we had a sign that we could change the wording on on a regular basis and things that we might could do to announce special programs and so forth. And so we started talking about a sign uh, with a, uh, a LED sign built into it 
Uh, we kept working on that. We got some quotes, talked to some people about that. And when we got the, uh, the figure, uh, we realized that it was a bridge too far. But we kept praying and we kept thinking and we kept moving forward to try to come up with what we would like to do. And the Lord always kept bringing us back to this original idea. So I went to talk to others, those who, uh, pastors who have those types of signs at their church, Thompson is one of those such churches, and begin to ask them, uh, was the sign helpful? Was the sign effective? Um, and they all came back and said, yes. In fact, Dr. Leslie Holmes, who has <coughs> preached here in the past, uh, was a huge advocate of his in Thompson, that it had actually brought visitors in because of uh, some of the things they were able uh, to do. But as we thought about LED signs, we knew that we needed to um, be mindful that we have a very traditional church, that we have a church that is um, important in terms of the building, although the building is by far the most Im not the most important thing that we do here. And so we began to craft a sign and talk to people that might uh, create a sign that would pay homage to our architecture and to our church and at the same time uh, accomplish the good things that we wanted to accomplish. Well, as we prayed and as we got the quote for the sign, uh, it came in at a very high price. Uh, I had expected that price because a friend of mine installs LED signs at churches in North Carolina. He's probably put in more in North Carolina than any other sign <coughs> company in North Carolina. And he told me that we needed to expect to spend between thirty-five dollars and $40,000 for such a sign. Well, we, then we thought the bridge was really too far <laughs> to, to reach. But we kept praying and we kept talking and we kept working. And as we got a design, and we're going to pass out a copy of that design to you all in just a few minutes, um, we decided that let's pray about this specific idea of having an LED sign and one that is not flashy but is effective in what we want to do. And we came up with what we'll hand out to you in, in just a few minutes. In fact, if you all want to go ahead and be handing those out, now that would be great. Such a sign will get people's attention. It will be able to. We'll be able to advertise um, what we are doing in the community and here at this church. We'll be able to make announcements. We'll be able to program to promote programs like grief share and Bible studies, Sunday school times of worship, and special uh, events. And it would say that we are committed to this community, that we are invested in the kingdom of God. But we still had the issue of money. We felt like the sign was very tasteful. Most everything is communicated on a dark black background, as you can see. And we would be able to, through the good work of Jennifer and Mike, be able to program what we needed to show on that. Well, as we prayed about it, we decided that we wanted to take it to the session. The vision committee was, which is made up, as I announced earlier, of deacons and women's ministries and elders and others. We decided that we would support it. We voted unanimously to do that. And then we took it to the session with fear and trepidation. Because we wanted to do it right. We wanted to bring God glory and do it right and do the things that we needed to do to move our church in a forward position. Well, the session overwhelmingly supported it as well. And the thing that has moved me the most in all of this 
is that it carried a price tag of uh, $36,000. And we thought, where are we going to get $36,000? But would you believe that through the pledges and contributions of just the vision committee and the session, we raised $36,000 to pay for this sign. Uh, it will not impact the church budget. Uh, those who've made the pledge have pledged not to let it interfere with their tithe. And so we wanted you to have a chance to see it this morning. It is paid for or will be paid for by uh, the end of June through the contributions of your session and your vision committee who are so excited about it. Uh, I've asked the vision committee as well as the session to gather in the fellowship hall after worship this morning, after we finish communion, coming to God's table to answer any questions you may have uh, about it. Uh, the sign is proposed to be located in the side part near Church Lane, over here on the side, that gives us the best opportunity for people driving down the street to see it. it won't change the front look of our church. We'll leave uh, the current sign that was donated many, many years ago uh, by a dear friend of our church. It will leave that sign right there uh, in memory of the young man that it was put there for. Uh, but this sign will... Uh, hopefully enable us to uh, stir the community to, uh, to worship. We'll have the opportunity to uh, put verses of the month and so forth up there. And it's my hope and my prayer that as we do this, and I think it's a, a, a great testament to the vision committee that they were so bold in their approach is to even consider this, in the session for supporting it, that um, there will be an influence for Christ in the community when we're not here. And so I'm very excited uh, about it. Uh, we've already raised half the money uh, and uh, in hand, and we have the other half in pledges that will be paid for by June 30th. Um, and so we're excited, and the session is excited, and the vision committee is excited, and Monica and I uh, believe that it is uh, a great step forward for this church. It will serve you many years after I'm long gone and dead. And so I'm excited for the kingdom, kingdom of God. It is a lot of money. Uh, I am respectful that we should be always be mindful of the church's money. And so that's why I was so thrilled that we were able to raise enough from the session in the vision committee uh, to make this happen. So the vision committee and the elders will be in the fellowship hall after service. If you have any questions, uh, please go in there and ask them. Uh, if you have any comments, give them to them. Uh, it is a long process uh, to get it made, and so it will be late in the fall uh, before uh, it actually comes to, uh, to fruition. But all of that is an exciting announcement, I think, for our church. And it, you know, I'm sure there will be some that uh, may not be excited until they actually see it, but I do believe once you see it, uh, you'll be enthusiastic about it. And we hope that it will speak to our community that we are moving forward in the kingdom of God uh, here. Bill, I hope that's a long time before you're gone and uh, <laughs> dead. <laughs> me, me too, John. <laughs> Old Testament reading this morning, I'll be reading from Psalm 17. Verses 1 through 5 and verse 15. A prayer of David. Hear a just cause, O Lord, attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer from 
lips free of deceit. From your presence, let my vindication come. Let your eyes satisfied with your life. Our next hymn this morning you will find on page 393, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. If you will stand with me once more, please. <laughs> Our New Testament reading this morning, I'll be reading from Romans 9, verses 1 through 5. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from there their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Blessed be the reading and the hearing of God's holy word. Thank you, Johnny. Um, before we do our prayer of intercession, I'm going to ask uh, Mary Will. She'll come down here. Uh, what you may not know is that Mary Will is headed oh, dare I say it, Matt, to the University of Alabama <laughs> this week and uh, to begin her career there and one that we'll watch with great interest in the days ahead. And I thought it would be appropriate that we would 
uh, pray for Mary Will as she goes. Um, there's a lot that goes on in the world outside of Louisville, Georgia, and she's been exposed to some of it, but um, I'm sure her mom and daddy will appreciate if we would pray for her as well. So let's do that now. Father God, we are thankful for Mary Will, for the uh, beautiful life that you've created in her. And we pray, Father, now that as she goes to Alabama and as she begins her career there, this change, this next step in her life, uh, that she would plant a signpost there as well for the Lord, that she would go with your blessing and your watch care over her, that you would keep her, and that you would um, open up the storehouses of heaven to bless her there. May her life there be a testimony to her faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And Father, we do pray for her family uh, as they take her this week, that they would feel the very hand of God on them as well, that they would have a peace uh, about uh, Mary Will's going, and that they would sense uh, your watch care over her. And so, Father, bless her in the days ahead, for we ask it in the strong name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. As we come to our prayer time, uh, there are a couple of... Uh, New folks, um, or one new folk in your bulletin, and a couple of other ones that I want to make you aware of. Uh, I got a text that Rita Colvern should be going home, I think, this week from the hospital. <clears throat> so we praise the Lord uh, for that. Frank Bevan continues to uh, recover from his uh, surgery. I've got on here Rary, uh, Bear, Reverend Barry Dagenhart. Uh, Barry is a dear friend of mine. I serve on Bon Clark and board with him. He, at one point in time, pastored a church in my hometown. His wife uh, taught my kids in school. Barry fell a couple of weeks ago, probably two weeks ago now, and hit his head and had a brain bleed and has been in and out of intensive care um, for the last two weeks and so I would personally ask and if you get the ARP update uh, you may have seen that already uh, that we would pray for uh, Barry in the days ahead also uh, Ross is with us this morning and his uh, grandmother is in need of prayer and then I was also given the name of Mark uh, Brad Brady. Uh, who is in need of prayer, and we'll add those, and I'll find out some more details about those uh, in the week ahead. Let's go to the Lord in a time of prayer. Gracious God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we come this morning, remembering all of these folks, we're thankful for how well so many are doing uh, with their treatments. We think of Jeff Partridge and <coughs> his incredible stamina within his chemotherapy and father we he gives you all the praise and we do as well but we certainly would praise you that rita is going to go home this week we pray and that her recovery would continue and that you'd be with joe as uh, he takes care of her and stephanie father we do pray for frank uh, we pray for barry as well and we are reminding of Ross's grandmother, and certainly uh, Mark Brady in these days as well. But Father, others here on our uh, list need your watch care. Uh, some are in the midst of terrible diseases like ALS. Others are in need of uh, healing. And, and Father, we would pray that you would encourage them. Uh, on my heart in particular is Miss Joyce this morning, Lord, that you would uh, continue to uh, just bring healing to her life. Father, all these we do commit uh, to your face, praying for our church as well. Uh, this month, Lord, as new prayer cards have gone out, we're praying for 
uh, God's protection over staff and students as they return to school. Uh, Lord, it is a, a, a hectic time for those who are teaching, and we would pray and bless those uh, teachers and students. Father, help us in times of temptation uh, that you would steer us uh, back into a relationship with you, that we would be able to turn our back and follow the path from temptation that you have provided for us. Father, we do pray for our elders uh, as they strive so hard to, to shepherd our church. We pray and we, they would be blessed by the, the study and reading that we are doing now on uh, what it means to be a shepherd leader. And Father, I'm thankful for each one of the men who serve this church. Uh, Father, we do pray for our Sunday school uh, quarter that we launched this morning on Genesis and that it would be honoring to you and that we would be uh, mindful to say what the text says and not say what the text doesn't say. Father, lead us as we come to your table this morning. Prepare our hearts to meet you here. For we ask it in the strong name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. As the ushers come forward, I would remind you that God has blessed our church, and we are to return a portion of that blessing to Him as part of our tithes and offerings. thankful for these tithes and offerings. We're thankful for all those who love this church and give so generously to it. Father, bless this generosity uh, on our part to you for your glory. Use it for this kingdom work that we're about here. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. You'll be turning in your Bibles to Matthew 22. Matthew 22. We'll be reading the first uh, 14 verses of this chapter as we get, again make our way through the last week of Christ. 
So let's stand as we do each week in honor of God's Word, for we believe and we teach that the Bible is the infallible and inerrant Word of God, perfect in all that it contains. God breathed out Word for us as children of the King. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast. But they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited... See, I have prepared my dinner, my ox and my fat, fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business. While the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry. And he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their cities. And he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you can find. And those servants went out to the roads and gathered all who they found, both bad and and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in and looked at the guest, he saw a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness, into the place <clears throat> there will be weep in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Father, we pray that you would bless the reading and the hearing of this your word, but may we see no man save Christ alone, for it's in his name we ask it. Amen. Be seated. We've come now to the third in a series of parables that Jesus has been teaching to the people around him, condemning the religious elite for, in, at least in part, their hypocrisy. Let me remind you on this Communion Sunday that we are in the last week of Jesus' life and ministry before his crucifixion. And again, in this parable, Jesus uses a very familiar um, aspect of human life in the first century to make his important point. Jesus is so good about using stuff around him to teach. And so it is here. Now, I will say that this parable is one of the most allegorical parables we have in the Bible. We want to make sure that we read it correctly as we do all of Scripture. Uh, but this one is very allegorical in its nature. But in the end... I hope to show you what the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is like. Remember, Matthew won't use the term kingdom of God very much. His book is a very Jewish gospel, and nobody, uh, no good Jew would speak the name of God. And so he writes about the kingdom of heaven, but it is in other gospels referred to as the kingdom of God, and those are interchangeable uh, phrases. Now the setting is a wedding feast put on by a king, perhaps for the crown prince. It is put on for the good of 
the people that the king has invited. It is a glorious feast, a joyous occasion. In Jesus' day, a wedding uh, would last sometimes a whole week as a feast and party. And so that's what's going on here. Think of a wedding for the king's son, though. Perhaps in your mind you could, if you were as old as I am, go back to the wedding of Prince Charles and Lady Diana, that spectacle that was viewed by so many on TV, all the grandeur and the pop and circumstances that surrounded it, or if you're a bit younger, maybe, or a little more hipper than I am, you could think of uh, Will and Kate's wedding that was recently uh, on uh, TV. Such lavish affairs, such a an honor to be invited to the banquet of the king. Well, verse 3 here tells us that the king who has invited his guest sends the servants out to say, it's ready. Come on. The party is about to start. Everything is ready. But we have this incredibly strange turn of events here in this story because those who have been given an opportunity to come to a feast of the king ignore him. They refuse to come. Can you imagine refusing to come to an event that your king has put on? So and again, in verse 4, he sends out more servants saying, Look, the food's ready. Come on. Come, eat, enjoy, celebrate with me the wedding of my son. But again, in verse 5, they refuse. One says that they're going to their field rather than coming to this lavish banquet. Another says, I've got business to do. So they reject the king's invitation. And eventually they even so reject the king's invitation that they beat, humiliate, and kill the people who have come to remind them that they've been invited to something by the king. In Luke, there is a whole list, in, in a similar parable, there's a whole list of excuses. And that's what it is. Excuses. Rem imagine the hatred that the king must have experienced from his people that they would refuse to come to the wedding of his son. They turn their backs on the invitation to the wedding. The people who reject the invitation usually fall into two groups. There is the group that would rather do something else. It's not that they couldn't come. There was nothing present. They didn't present any excuse that said, I would love to come, but I've got an illness, I've got this, I've got that, I can't come. It's not that they couldn't come, it's the fact that they blatantly wouldn't come. They simply turned their back on the king and went in a different direction. And the second group are those that were not just indifferent to the king, but were actually hostile. They're the ones who beat the servants and kill them, mistreated them in every way. And this refusal by both groups is an absolute insult to the king. It's the last straw. He gets mad. He gets angry. After all, he, he's gone to all this trouble, not just to celebrate his son, but to provide an opportunity a grandeur opportunity that 
Only a few who were invited could co even come to it. But they wouldn't. And so the king, in his anger, brings judgment upon all those who would not come. He kills the murderers and burns the city of those who refuse to come to the ground. Well then, and because the feast was ready, he invites others. Now, I hope that it's pretty clear to y'all who all the characters are here. The king is obviously God. The son whose banquet is being prepared is Jesus. The invitation has gone out to the people, but they've refused to come. That would be the Jews. The prophets are the servants who were beaten and mistreated. But now the king invites others. That would be, for the purpose of the parable here, us, Gentiles. And he invites them to come. And I find it interesting that it says... Go out, and so they go out, and they gather all, this is in verse 10, all whom they found both bad and good. You see, the point there is that the kingdom of God is open to everyone. The kingdom of God is, is open to all kinds of people. The gospel is for all to hear. But then our parable takes an even stranger turn, doesn't it? If you've got your Bibles there, you see in verse 11 this additional strange happening. The king came and looked at the guest, and he saw that there was a man with no wedding garment, and he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? That would be, in Jesus' day, a wedding garment was a robe that you kind of kept out of the normal flow of your clothes so that you had something really clean to wear for special occasions. That was what a wedding garment was in Jesus' day. And, and this one is there without a wedding garment, and he is speechless. Then the king has him thrown out into, as it would read, hell. And as we read that, we might cry out, that's certainly not fair. These people were invited to come at the last minute to come off the streets. How is this one to go and procure a wedding garment? Well, if we're to understand what Jesus is meaning here by wedding garment, the wedding garment would represent the righteousness of Christ. No one will be at the feast of the bridegroom without the righteousness of Christ. And the king recognizes this one who has slipped into the feast without the righteousness of Christ. And he's cast out. You see, it is that righteousness that we are to be clothed with. That is, not our, the righteous works of which are filthy rags that we own. But as we talk about so often here, when we come to the cross, faith in Jesus Christ, we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. When God looks at us, He sees Christ's righteousness, not our own. And then because we're going to finish in a hurry here, we get this strange verse in 14 which drips with the doctrine of election. Many are called, but few are chosen. It's impossible to read this without seeing election there, I think. Many hear the outward call. We are to, to speak to those about the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're to talk about it. We're to tell people about it. I talked just yesterday with 
a man who said that one of our members had wives had spoken, one of our members who is a wife, had spoken to his girlfriend about coming to church. I had been ministering to the husband. One of you had been ministering and inviting her. That's what we're to be about. Talking to everyone about Jesus. But the point here is that not everyone that we tell about Jesus will come to Christ. That takes the load off our hearts, doesn't it? All we have to do is share the gospel. It's up to God to do the rest. And so because many hear but few are chosen, we have an obligation to talk to the many because we never know who will come gloriously clothed in the righteousness of Christ to the banquet table that we will be at one day. And we can look up and see and say, Oh, I know you. I talked to you about Jesus. I am so glad God changed your heart. And they will say to you, Thank you for planting that seed. Someone else perhaps watered it. But I am privileged through the grace of Christ to meet you here at the table. And so we'll come to the Lord's table here this morning and partake of the goodness of God for us all. Amen. Father, we pray now that as we come to your table, that you would bless our time here. We pray that you would meet us here in a grand and glorious way, that the gospel would be near and dear to our hearts as we find you here. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you all, it may take uh, three trips since we've got such a great crowd uh, this morning, um, but I invite you to come to the Lord's table. Come not because you have to, but because you may. Come and meet the King of your soul here today. This is not the table of Louisville Presbyterian Church. This is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so I invite all who have prepared in their hearts to come, to come. But if you're not ready this morning, if you don't have that relationship with Jesus that makes Him your Lord and Savior, I would just simply ask that you stay seated, lest you drink and eat God's judgment upon yourself. But for all who have confessed their sins, for all who have Long to spend time with Jesus. Come and enjoy his fellowship here this morning. Hear the words of the institution as given to the Apostle Paul. For I receive from the Lord that which I pass on to you, that the Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes again. May we pray. Father, we pray that you would now bless these elements so much as may be used of them from a common to a sacred use. May we come and feast on the body of Christ. May we drink the blood of Christ in holy communion with him. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I invite you to come. Uh, we'll seat as many as we can and as many... Take as much time as we need to this morning.
the Lord Jesus Christ on the night he was betrayed took bread and after he broke it he said take eat this is my body which is broken for you same way after the supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me Go in the peace of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. I invite anybody else who would like to come this morning to come. to make this work. Y'all come on in the second row and we'll pass there at the second row uh, as well. This is my body broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to also love one another. After the supper, he took the cup, and having given thanks as we have done in his name, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink this whenever you do it in remembrance of me.
go in the peace and the grace of our trying God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, it is with your goodness and grace that we have met you here at this table to proclaim your death until you come back again. And so, Father, we would pray with the early church. Come, Lord Jesus, for we ask it in his name. Amen. We read in the Gospels that when they had finished the supper, they sang a psalm before they go, went out. So we'll sing the first and the last of the hymn, uh, last stanza of uh, the hymn of praise uh, found in the back of your hymnals. <laughs> any uh, questions on the new sign you can talk with the session in the vision committee and the fellowship hall immediately after the service now receive the benediction now to the king eternal immortal invisible the only true god be honor and glory forever and ever amen, amen.